42 days to election 2020. Hello and welcome to Election Brief here on your election headquarters. Coming up in the next 55 minutes, police launches investigations into MPP and NDC peace walk at Jamestown, which turned violent. We have updates as the security experts urge the police to be on the lookout for such flashpoints ahead of the December polls. As have adequate police protection to ensure that you know, the, 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 the surge in violence is contained at the lowest possible uh, uh, level. Meanwhile, the Ghana Police Service says it is working to ensure incidents like yesterday's violence at Ododododio do not recur before, during and after the election. We'll hear from Director of Operations of the Ghana Police Service. Also, Executive Director of Centre for Democratic Development says vigilantism still persist in the country in spite of a law banning the activities is the vigilantism problem a, a problem of inadequate law i don't think so right so whatever it is whatever violence whatever threats of violence that are perpetrated by so-called vigilantes are already offend existing law also in this edition, Electoral Commission begins printing of ballot papers for this year's election amidst concerns raised by opposition NDC over some of the printing houses contracted for this exercise. And finally, religious leaders caution against violence and the creation of what they call fear and panic as the country prepares for the polls. It's mind to cause trouble. You make up your mind to cause speed. We are live on your DSTV channel 421 and Go TV channel 144 on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Follow Joy News on TV. We stream on myjoyonline.com. On YouTube, we are Joy News TV. Stay tuned in. Thanks for staying with us. Now, the MPP parliamentary candidate at Odududududu constituency, Nilante Banaman, is accusing the MP for the area, Nilante Vanderpoi, of masterminding the violent incident which took place there over the weekend. Police have launched investigations into the violence in Jamestown between supporters of the opposition and DC and the governing MPP over the weekend. In fact, this was on Sunday, just yesterday. In videos that have gone viral on social media, supporters of the two main parties were seen hurling stones at each other. Kweku Asante was in Jamestown and came through with this report. More than 10 persons sustained various degrees of injuries, some with cuts to their head, arm and abdomen, whilst others sustained bullet wounds. <laughs> Videos shared on social media show NDC and MPP supporters trading stones, bottles and occasionally gunfire. In the videos, some persons wearing NDC shirts and paraphernalia are seen vandalizing items in a one-story entertainment center said to be the base for the NPP. TV sets and other items were destroyed in the vandalism. The NDC and MPP are accusing each other of starting the fight. And Joy News has come across some fresh footage of the incident. Watch.
And this is a raging story today. My colleague Benjamin Akapo was at the scene earlier today. He joins me via Zoom. Benjamin, you were on the ground. What did you see and what did the residents tell you about this particular incident? In a nutshell, the residents want peace. They say they are tired of the... Yes, the residents, uh, that's what I'm reiterating, uh, they are saying the end is a cessation to that ahead of election 2020. In fact, there was an elderly woman who interacted with us and she was saying that uh, they would prefer to leave the neighborhood because it appears there is no peace there and they cannot live their lives like that. She indicated she had been born in 1959. She had been in this neighborhood for about 62 years. And she was tired of it. She couldn't, as an old woman, keep on like this. Basically, they want peace. They want the NPP and NDC feuding to stop. And, and that is the sentiment uh, uh, there. But if you spoke to any of those from the NPP end, started it, NDC end would also say it was the NPP that started it. Well, we'll get back to Benjamin. Uh, he was in the area earlier today speaking to residents, uh, trying to get a sense of what may have sparked this uh, latest violence. As you know, uh, some few months ago, the MP for the area was attacked. Uh, again, this is a hotspot we know. It's been identified as one of the major hotspots uh, by the police. And um, we've been on the ground speaking to residents. And as you heard uh, Benjamin say, one of the elderly women living in the area say they want to leave because of this uh, incessant uh, violence in the area. We can listen to the MPP uh, parliamentary candidate Nilan Tebanawan who addressed a press conference earlier today. We are however not the least surprised by these acts of violence considering the fact that in 2016 after a successful campaign launch at the famous Bukong Square this same MP led tax to go on a vandalization spree in the constituency on the back of yet another successful work in honor of in honor of the memory of our youth organizer the late william waters ras bustego on saturday the mp and his boys came running round again without any provocation it therefore goes without saying that these happenings in the constituency are explicitly orchestrated by the incumbent MP whose persona and character depicts violence. This was the same person who, as the NDC parliamentary candidate in 2004, was cited for electoral fraud and violence and was injuncted from contesting that year's elections. The constituency from then on experienced peaceful electioneering campaigns and elections until he resurfaced in 2012 to contest the NDC primaries, which again was characterized by violence he masterminded. The lead up to that year's election and the events before, during and after the 2016 elections is still fresh on the minds of people. Madam Esla Usu Akufu, Abu Jinapo, the late Jacob Echebilamte, and my good self have been victims of his staggery. Ladies and gentlemen of the press, yesterday's violent and unprovoked attacks goes to confirm that the MP has not departed from his violent ways. I hereby call on the police to, as a matter of urgency, arrest this NDC tax and let the law take its, full, its due course to serve as a deterrent to their likes. Failing which, our people will be left with no other option than to defend ourselves. For now, I can only urge my people to remain calm, even in the face of these extreme provocations. So the finger pointing continues. Well, the NDC has also been accusing the opponents. Scores of NDC supporters are receiving treatment currently at the Kolibu Teaching Hospital following the clash. My colleague Manuel Karanting uh, joins us via Zoom. He was at the hospital earlier. Manuel, what's the condition of the injured and how many could you count when you went there? Well, as of the time that I got there, there were just about two of them who were still 
uh, on ambition there. In fact, I'm told there were 15 of the um, you know people who are um, you know, suspected to have been sympathizers of the NDC who were brought there uh, last night. Um, 13 of them received treatment and were discharged subsequently. But two of them, um, you know, the first one um, has sustained gunshot wounds in his thigh. We're told that he was shot in his thigh and was brought to the hospital. And the other person, um, we're told, rammed his motorbike into um, a glass seat because uh, he was crossed by a vehicle um, um, at the time. And so th this is the number that we have currently at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital. Two of them on admission. We are told that they are being taken for uh, surgery. And, and the NBC uh, vice chairman who spoke to me uh, there tells me that uh, the NBC party is going to take the full cost of treatment of all of the uh, folks who um, sustain various degrees of injury there. And uh, talking about the allegations and so which were uh, being made, but that particular interaction I had with him was not short of that. He puts the blame squarely at the doorstep um, of the NPP. He mentioned some uh, names and, and says that the attack, especially like the clash that we saw yesterday, was as a result of a premeditated shot uh, to, um, um, you know, a counter their peaceful work. Um, we know that on Saturday, the MPP had a, uh, um, you know, procession on uh, within the constituency. The MPP had a procession within the constituency. And then Sunday, the NDC was supposed to have its own, which degenerated into the uh, violent clashes that we saw yesterday. And he said that that was a carefully thought out plan, which was only uh, to frustrate the NDC and make sure that um, their campaign was thwarted, uh, Araba. All right. Thank you, Manuel. And uh, we will be staying on this a while longer for all the updates and we'll be bringing you that. Uh, but we have both the communications officers for the two leading parties in that particular constituency. They are joining us via Zoom. Mustafa Nete is the NDC communications officer and Malik Abe is a communications officer for the MPP. We'll start with uh, you, uh, Mustafa. The constituency is in the news for all the wrong reasons. Mustafa, your MP has been accused of masterminding these attacks on the MPP supporters. How do you respond to it? Um, thank you very much. This is palpable falsehood. Palpable falsehood. You see, um, how could uh, the uh, MP mastermind these um, attacks? It is palpable falsehood simply because, you see, we, have, we are on a, a peaceful walk. We have started a peaceful walk. We have gone all the, uh, you know, gone through all the principal streets of Accra. I mean, Jamestown and its environs. And we actually, when we actually got to um, the high streets, we were passing peacefully until the tail end of our crowd got to um, um, where they call the Blue Gate. You know, just at that point, the MPP people started throwing bottles. I mean, when we're passing, a majority of the crowd has left. It was the tail end of it. And then they started throwing, pelting bottles at our people. That was what angered the people. In fact, Mustafa, Mustafa, hold on one second. Uh, I'm sure people are curious to know, did your uh, people, did your members provoke the MPP members in any way? I mean, what provoked the attack? Never at all. Never at all. We were on a peaceful walk. None of our people provoked any of them. Nobody threw anything at them. We were actually passing. And when we got there, when the tail end of our crowd got there, then a person, I saw the person, she was a, a, a young lady. She threw bottle from that rooftop to, um, 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 into our crowd. But we actually managed to take our people out to tell them that, look, Let's focus on our work and let's get out of here. A lot of the people have already marked, marched and they were ahead of us. So let's continue to go. We settled, we settled, we settled. And actually, the more we settled, the more they throw the bottles from the top to, to the down. In fact, I say it, it has been masterminded. Look, look at the video. You see the MPP tax holding crates of bottles. These are the people we are talking about. So at that point, they had hoarded a lot of bottles in crates. And they were pelting at the crowd that were passing. How could we have instigated it? How could the MP have instigated it? The MP had already, already left. He's way ahead of the crowd. 
and look at the tail end of the crowd mm. where the MP people are attacking the NDC. All right. All right. I'll come to you again, Mustafa. But Malik, um, do you know the people, your people, I'm talking about members of the MPP, who actually started throwing these bottles as alleged by the NDC? Hello, Malik. If you can hear me, who are your members who are said to have started throwing these bottles at uh, the NDC supporters? Have you been able to identify okay. them? Um, let me say a very good afternoon to viewers. Um, to move straight to your question about if I know our people, this is a question of thought, actually, because at the very moment that they, the NDC came to the Blue Gate area, that is the area of incidents, the question we asked ourselves was, one, why did they have to halt their uh, health work and be there to create a sense? Secondly, why would Buku Banku, who is one of the biggest advocates of John Brahman Mahama and the NDC in the constituency, climb up to ask the MPP people at Blue Gate to tell his very people to stop whatever they are doing and continue their health work? So that should tell you clearly that there was an attack from within the MP, NDC and their crowd to us at the top of Blue Gate before Buko Banku had to intervene and beg us and tell his fellow people to continue with the health work. So the question clearly is, what happened? Somebody actually threw a bottle from their crowd to us, to our end. And that is why Buko Banku had to walk and come and apologize on their behalf for the crowd to start moving. Nonetheless, they did not pay attention to his plea. And that was when all this helter skelter started. Because most of the people that were at the Blue Gate area are people who are, uh, they, they, they are harmless, they have nothing at hand. Because all of us over there were just watching the, 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 the float via social media, via Facebook. That is the official Facebook wall. So we noticed that when they got there, we were just watching our own thing, and then they started um, that uh, attack. So what we did was we had to run for our lives. And we had about three or four people, which is clearly in the video, who actually helped us to escape. They were holding crates. That they were blocking the, the, the stones and then the bottles that they were throwing. So it was their intervention that helped most of us to even escape the scene. And clearly from the video, you saw how they were actually throwing bottles and stones. And the question we put to them was that, it's the high street, Atamos High Street. How on earth would anybody hold stones and uh, bottles at the roadside, unless, of course, it is from their end. And we actually, from investigation, found out that the Abobo Yaa, that yellow van that was there, was actually the thing that was hosting the bottles and stones. So they had intentionally had to hold this thing and planted this thing so that they, um, they, they, they exhibit or execute this very plan. And I will attribute this to a very poor leadership on the side of the NDC. Because we went to a solidarity work the previous day and nothing of this happened. We did this because we had most of our executive members placed at vantage points within the queue. Their leader, who is Neil Ajay Vandapur, was part of the health work. Are you telling me and telling the whole world that if he, Neil Ajay Vandapur, who is noted for his violent attacks in MPP 2012, 2016, we know, and I don't want to recall history, and if, he's, uh, if Mustafa wants to doubt, I can recall the history right now, that if he had come out clearly to have spoken to his people that they should stop their act of violence and continue the health work, would this have happened? That is the question I put to him. But he stood there aloof and continued the work and told his hoodlums to set back and then destroy our place. So when we had evacuated the place, that is when the hoodlums of the, MP, uh, the NDC got the chance to have climbed our resource center and broken our, our towels, they broke in our uh, flash screen TVs, and then the refrigerator that we have there, they have totally vandalized the place. And this is the situation we are finding ourselves in because we know exactly what the NDC is about in Odudu Dio. In 2012, it happened. In 2016, it happened. It even went to the extent that he, Neil Ante Vandapoy, the MP, accepted a member of parliament, uh, uh, sorry, a parliamentary candidate in 2016, in broad daylight. So in the attributes of the NDC, we know that there are traces of violence. And he, John Domani Mahama, has already told us in um, February 2016, uh, February 2019, that when it comes to revolutionary roots, the NDC has it. And then nobody can match them when it comes to act of violence. And this is clearly what Neil Adebanapo has exhibited. For him to be part of this health work, 
and for he not to have called his boys to order for them to have vandalized MPP property, that you tell you that this man is somebody who is actually supporting a natural violence and does not want All any right. to be in the do Very well. So, I mean, clearly, the both of you are ac pointing accusing fingers at each other. But going forward, we do know that Ododododio has over the years been identified as a hotspot, a major hotspot, especially when it comes to elections. So what are you both going to do to ensure that going forward, we don't witness some of these violence uh, incidents that we saw yesterday? Perhaps we can start with you, Mustafa. Now, uh, let, me go, let me go by. He's raised a number of issues and I want to deal with it. He said, why did the NDC halted at the Blue Gate? He said, why did Bukon Banko had to climb to the top and also deal with, with this whole you know, mess? You see, um, I have sent your, 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 your um, re, uh, producer, Parker, I have sent him a video. I have sent him a video of one of the MPP columns running to the Blue Gate with, 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 with machete and then having pistol in his hand. He ran to the place and started firing guns. That hoodlum is already known. He's already, he is the same person who attacked the N N MP at the police station. Everybody know him. He's been wielding gun, firing at everybody in the, the, the judio. He's the same person that attacked the MP, like I said. During the registration, I mean the uh, 2020 registration, he is the same person moving from one polling station to the other, other vandalizing and, and, and him you to know, the police. Causing, have you passed on this information? Uh, Mustafa, have you reported yeah. him to the police? Have you passed on this evidence we, you have to we, the police? We have, we have reported this several times to the police station. Look, go send your cameras and your reporters to the Jamestown police station and you'll be told the number of reports we have, you know, we have done there. Again, um, during, during the time, you know, GM, during the registration, John Dramani Mahama visited some polling stations in Accra. This same hoodlums also attacked the NDC um, um, executives when the, the, the like when John Dramani visited Ododododio. We recorded and we also reported the same to the Jamestown police station. You know, even yesterday, when the whole issue happened, these hoodlums were running around every house in Jamestown, attacking people. When I was even at the, the uh, when we were at the uh, accident center of Kolibu uh, Teaching Hospital, these people, the, the people that we, they were attacking in the vicinity, they were bringing them one after the other with machete wounds. Some of them had gunshots on their legs. Some of them had uh, bottle cuts on their on, on them. Now we know we know um, these are uh, these are orchestrated attacks. Already, you know, when all these things started, Honorable Neil Antevanda Poe has already restrained his people that, look, these attacks will come, but don't also retaliate. So all the NDC people have never retaliated in all of these things. Mustafa, now, let, you let's make that, progress. Let, let, Mustafa, let me finish. Let me finish. Let's before, make progress. before yesterday, we had already sent this matter to our chiefs. We have already sent this matter to the government, and the government had come up with a roadmap where our political activities are going to be, you know, uh, properly delineated. So when we go for the house to house today, then the MPP also follows tomorrow. Now, actually, when we, we, we have abided by all of these things, yesterday, uh, the, the, the day before yesterday, they had their own peacefully. When we had our own, when we got there, they started throwing the bottles at us. So Tukum Banku got to the top to, to tell them that, look, stop what you are doing. What you are doing will create tension. Point earlier. A lot of, uh, Mustafa, uh, we don't uh, have uh, much time. You've made that point earlier. Let's make progress. How do we ensure that we don't witness uh, violence like this going forward? We have 42 days to the elections. What's your side going to do? I have said, when all these things happen, we took it to the government chair, roadmap was drawn. But at that meeting, because it, it, it is an uh, it is an intentional something, Neil and Banaman said that, look, in 2016, just like Malik, Malik is saying, in 2016, they, 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 they vandalized our things. In 2012, they did the same. And so this time, we are going to retaliate. And that is what Banaman said when we met the chiefs. And so what happened yesterday, we knew it was an attack from the MPP. It was something that had been orchestrated. When you go to the top, you realize that in a video, 
sports guys are having crates of bottles. They have packed crates of bottles at the top. Now, when we are when, when the NDC is passing, they are going to pass them with their bottles. They are going to cause harm to their bodies, and that is what they did. I have sent your 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 producer a video to uphold that the people in the area. A lot of the people were holding guns. Mustafa, they were firing. Like Mustafa, what? is your side going to do to uphold the peace in the area and avert the loss of lives? That's the question I'm asking you. We, we have already extended our hand. I said we reported to our chiefs and said that what is happening, it is causing harm to okay. our brothers. Very Malik well. is my brother. Very well. Malik is my brother. Okay. Let and me, I will let, not do let, such let thing me, to let him. Let me put the same and question that is to why Malik. I am saying that, that is why I'm saying that we have somebody at the presidency. If he's committed to making sure that all these things come to a halt, he would put his hand to the cherry. Very well, we, very well. We believe that when he put his hand to the cherry and order his boys to stop what they are doing, all of these things will come to an end. Very, very well. Thank you. Malik, what about you? What is your side committing to do to ensure that there's peace going forward? Well, our side, obviously, no, 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 is very grateful to this government because we've had unprecedented achievements and developments, which we are made on campaigning on to make sure that we unseat the current MP who actually has no or not little achievement in the constituency. Now, moving forward, the, he spoke about the gamma check case. Yes, there was this agreement that we'll be having a campaign every now and then that we actually do because the whole of last week, because of the demise of our youth organizer, RAS, We've not been able to do any campaign activity. And there hasn't been a single class after that ab agreement was signed with, uh, between us and the government chair and the NDC. We haven't had any clash or whatsoever. So it was only their peace work that they orchestrated to actually vandalize our properties that led to this. Moving forward, we, we held a press conference earlier today around 10 a.m. to call our boys to order, tell them not to retaliate or do anything that will bring the name of the MPP or Neil Ante Bannerman into dismay. Because now every single thing that is happening in the constituency, they, the NDC, want to draw sympathetic votes out of it. To say that Neil Ante Bannerman is the, he's now the angel and um, is right. somebody that is not drawn to violence. Meanwhile, they know very well that this man is a man who is a very violent man and record has, or the past track of what he has done has been able to show it. So he, Neil Ante Bannerman, has come out clearly and extended his hand to the NDC to let them know that he's a man of peace. And ever since he became a leader of the NPP, it is just about records and just about developments in the do do. So all what we advocate for is let the communications officers of both the NDC and the NPP in the Odododio constituency and clearly the finger pointing is still continuing. But the police say that they will put men on the ground to ensure uh, that there is no further outbreak of violence there. Well, prior to the incident, Odododio had already been earmarked by the police as being prone to violence. It has 50 different flashpoints there alone. Uh, security analyst Kenel Fesses Abadji is of the view that the agency should keep a closer eye on the constituency. Controlled by the uh, NDC. Should the NDC now say because they are provoked by the presence of their opponent in their area, they're going to use firearms? Mm -hmm. So the bottom line is that the conduct of political parties in this country is reprehensible, cannot be justified. And it's very sad when you, 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 you have party executives coming to explain that NDC started or MPP started. It shouldn't have happened. Uh, and and, and the as we head, as we inch closer to the December 7th poll, this year the campaigning has taken a different twist because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so a lot of these, uh, the parties, the two major parties, are using these walks as a means of um, uh, campaigning and making their presence felt within the constituencies. Um, although the Diodo, for instance, is a closely knit uh, community, um, what would be your advice going for it as far as political activity is concerned because they have to devise means of carrying out their messages. We cannot hold uh, huge rallies anymore. And so these are the, the strategies deployed by the parties. Going forward, what will be your advice on how such political activity should be handled? There, there is nothing wrong with a peace march, even if it wasn't for COVID. Anybody who wanted as part of its political campaign strategy to undertake a peace walk or health walk or whatever it is. It's, it's, it's a political right or civil right. Nobody can deny any party that. 
you know. So the, the, the question probably should not be what we should be doing. You see what I mean? Mm. The bottom line is that political parties are the ones behind these kinds of activities. They are the ones who condone the impunity. For instance, it was on 1st September, the last time that anything happened at Ododododo or that Jamestown police station, when the MP was assaulted, yeah. what has been the outcome? For all you know, some influential people, through telephone calls or other means, have prevailed upon the police not to act. You see? So if the police cannot act because its hands are tied, what, what else do we expect you know, the police to do? Mm. But having said that, as far as the police is concerned, and given the premise that you use for this segment, yeah. that if you map out flashpoints, that is not the end of itself. What measures are you going to put in place to ensure that you contain uh, any incidents of, of violence? I have suggested that the police could have scaled up the protection that they were affording or according to the NDC match. Mm -hmm. But be it as it may, this is a case study. And I think going forward, all political party activities of this nature must have adequate police protection. And speaking of the police, the Ghana Police Service says it is working to ensure incidents like yesterday's violence at Odududu do not recur before, during or after the elections. Director of Operations of the Police Service, Dr. Saibu Pabi Gariba, says the National Security Tax Force is paying keen attention to such incidents and lessons learned will inform deployments on Election Day. He's been speaking at a forum on peace and security organized by the Ministry of Parliamentary Affairs. Our Parliamentary Affairs correspondent, uh, Joseph Opokugaku, joins us uh, via Zoom. So, Joseph, what have the other leaders in Parliament been saying about tackling political violence in the country? And so um, it's been a general conversation on how to ensure adequate security going into the upcoming election. Uh, for example, the Director of Operations of the Ghana Police Service, Dr. Uh, uh, Pariba Gariba, indicated that they've identified a number of hotspots and there's a continuous learning process that's ongoing. The Election Security Task Force is constantly equipping various intelligence that they have on the hotspots as a way to ensure that uh, there's adequate security on Election Day. And referencing the Ododio incident, making the point that all the lessons are being learned so that then there isn't a repeat of it on Election Day. Uh, there is um, general uh, co comment from both leaders of the House in terms of the majority and the minority about the need for the police to step up the work that they're doing when it comes to both intelligence gathering and adequate deployment. The majority leader, Osei Chemen Sabuns, who is also the Minister for Parliamentary Affairs, noted with concern that there's been a number of incidents of violence and even situation of deaths involving political actors, which he found to be very worrying, referencing the death of the Infantiman MP. Echo Hayford and making the point that there's even been incidents of threats directed at some of them, the political actors, including himself, going into the next election, which he thought was very much out of place. Um, Inusa Fuseni, who represented the leadership of the minority, said that what they expect from the police is very heightened levels of uh, professionalism, even as they police the processes going into the elections. And for him, that's the only way to ensure adequate public confidence in the ability to protect them on election day. Joseph Apokugapo with that update from that forum that was held earlier at the Ministry of Parliamentary Affairs on Elections and Security. Many thanks, Joseph. Well, Inspector General of Police James Opong Bueno is on a working visit of the OT region. Regional correspondent Peter Senu joins us uh, with what to expect of the IGP's visit. Peter, so what's the IGP expected to do whilst in the region? Well, the IGP arrived this morning in the OT region uh, where he was. Uh, he inspected a guard of uh, honor mounted for him here at the regional capital and subsequently went to, you know, have a tete-a-tete -tete with the regional minister, went to uh, see the chiefs of, of, of the regional capital. And he's also been monitoring a simulation exercise that has been, um, I mean, displayed here in readiness for the December 7 elections. Um, and about the, the, the IGP has been speaking to a few issues uh, regarding police welfare in the region. Yeah, 
main, one main concern raised by the chief of the area is accommodation for newly posted uh, police personnel into the region, which the IGP reacted that he will do everything within his power within the shortest possible time to make sure that accommodation is provided for them. He also called on the chiefs to, as a matter of agency, make accommodations available for rent, even for, for, for his men, as he makes sure that he pulls them into the region. For the uh, insufficient numbers, the IGP said he would, I mean, dispatch 40 men into the region uh, in readiness for, for the December 7 um, elections. And so the IGP just addressed us briefly, and he's going to uh, inspect, I mean, join his men for a deba before he leaves the region. That is what he's been doing uh, while he is here with us in the region. And so whatever it is, I will bring it to our listeners and viewers in subsequent bulletins. Welcome back to Election Brief here on your election headquarters. Now, Executive Director of the Center for Democratic Development, Professor H. Kwesi Prempe, says vigilantism will continue to persist in the country in spite of the law which was passed to deal with it. Professor Prempe believes the solutions to dealing effectively with vigilantism are more political than legal. His comments come as other governance experts raise concern about vigilantism and the lack of political will to check it. Election-related conflicts have really degenerated into, you know, just widespread, wide, wide, uh, you know, large-scale killings, you know, uh, and conflicts. Sometimes close to uh, civil conflict, civil war in in many other countries. And I think we should not take our luck for granted. Mm. You know, there is really nothing uh, about us that makes us different from Cote d'Ivoire or Kenya, you know, and, and so I think we, it's something that we need to seriously manage. The underlying factors are there. But then on top of it are other things we, we ourselves, mm. but the, the way we have managed or mismanaged our politics mm. have also introduced, which is this problem of vigilantes, you know, and we definitely need to wrestle with that problem, right? Again, it has We saw a law, we saw a law being passed. Again, again, is it, is it a problem of inadequate law? You know, is the vigilantism problem a, a problem of inadequate law? I don't think so, right? So whatever it is, whatever violence, whatever threats of violence that are perpetrated by so-called vigilantes, are already offend existing law. Right. So what is different is the political or partisan nature of the targeting. Mm. So I'm not opposed to saying that, for example, if you perpetrate violence on a person merely by virtue of their political identity or their party identity, we aggravate the offense and therefore you get a severe sanction. So the sanction side, we can change it. But otherwise, it's, it's a criminal offense nonetheless. But has the law itself changed anything? Well, it, it does try to aggravate the sanction. Uh, but in terms of what it is that is driving this thing, they are political drivers. The drivers are political. They are not legal loopholes. And part of it is also, unfortunately, divided partisan trust, not, not just in the EC, but also in the security agencies mm. who also play a major role in our elections. So you just had the executive director of the Ghana Center for Democratic Development, H. Crazy Prempe, in that interview with Daniel Dazi, who's host of On the Record, which airs on the Joy Prime channel. That interview will air at 8 p.m. later tonight. Now, let's hit the campaign trail. And with a housing deficit of over 2 million, the country requires 70,000 housing units to meet the demand. But inadequate regulation and high cost of houses built for sale has left one third of Ghanaians living in insanitary conditions. Now, government is, however, hoping to deal with it with the introduction of the Mortgage Financing Fund. At the start of his two day tour of the Greater Accra region, President Ikufuado commissioned a 204 housing unit financed by the Tema Development Corporation and a consortium of banks at a cost of 45 million CDs. 
He's been addressing the gathering at Tema Community 22. Fundamental human need, if not indeed a basic right. Traditionally, house ownership is a symbol of diligence and accords dignity and respect in society. As a result, everyone strives to own a house in their lifetime. This notwithstanding, our nation has not done enough to promote house ownership in an organized and equitable manner. The housing industry in general has seen slow development over the years. The land tenure system, lack of effective regulation, and le legal framework have together worked against this very important sector of our economy. The evidence suggests that Ghanaians spend a considerable part of their income on rent, especially those living in regional capitals and urban cities. The cost of houses on the market exceeds the means of many ordinary workers who have no hope of ever owning their own homes during their working lifetime. The alternative for some will be to acquire lands in the outskirts of the city and use an average of seven to 10 years to put up their own houses, having to deal with issues of multiple sales of those lands, in addition to the many struggles and intimidation from land guards. Let's go on the phone lines and speak to presidential correspondent Elton John Brobe. So Elton, now what more can you tell us about where the president has been and what he's been saying? Right, so about the, obviously, the first part of call was the Tamara Community 22, where he commissioned the 204 housing units. And as far as the ongoing plans, according to the president by government, to replicate this in the other region. And this they, 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 they describe as affordable houses for low income earners. Mm -hmm. And the target in this category are public servants. Right. And the, the, the property consists of one bedroom apartment and two bedroom apartments. And even though they are looking at its affordability, it will set you back between 170 and 240,000 dollars to the 201. Mm. But the, the, the good news for those who have already acquired uh, some of these properties is that Ghana Commissioner Bamu is one of the banks, but now in the development process, to undertake this project. has already underwritten. Uh, the mortgage money involved, which means that it is not a rent to pay facility. Those who have applied and been given the property will pay the rent that the water was paid to any developer and then will pay back to the other commercial bank. And then after some time, when uh, the, the amount of money involved is complete, then the property becomes uh, the bona fide uh, you know, property of the person living in this uh, building. For President Kufado, uh, he says that his government is looking at uh, doing similar projects in the country because they are looking at reducing the housing deficit, which currently is about 2 million, and they require 70,000, which is price on the high side. So they want to partner the private sector to do this and do it very well. Finance Minister says that if the NPP is elected in the next government, starting 2021, housing is one of the key priorities of the government, meaning its own words. We are looking at housing as a major economic activity that the government will undertake uh, beginning 2021 uh, across the country because they want to look at a position where um, a large majority of the populace who own their own home currently one third live in places they want to describe as insanity, where you have a large number of people uh, use large parts of their income as rent. They describe this as unacceptable and something that they want to do away with. But currently, as we see, we are at a form in the Mania Koba district of the Eastern region. And President Kukori a while ago commissioned a form, uh, which will fit in for years of the VRA. Okay. Now, the good news for this is that the government is looking at permanently dealing with the issue of power outages and unreliable power supply. Mm. So, when they're coming into force of this uh, retrofitted project, we are looking at 30 years of guaranteed reliable power okay. supply. From the pong uh, jam. Also, the energy minister has announced that because of the excess power the country generates every month, 
they are now in a position to export 240 megawatts of power to neighboring countries. The government is also in the process of paying off debt incurred by the power producers as a result of, you know, uh, some power plants that were brought into the country by the elsewhere and the administration, which have become idle. So, what of call, and very soon we are moving into the, the Macron symbol area where the president cut forth for what? Realization of the Many thanks for that update, presidential correspondent Elton John Broby there. Now, running mate of NDC flag bearer, Professor Nana Jane Opokwajaman, has challenged women not to be put off by the setbacks they may encounter in their attempts to run for public office. Although women make up 51% of the population, less than 30% are included in the decision-making process of public life. As you know, women face challenges such as lack of finance, in their attempts to contest political races. Addressing, addressing uh, female professionals and women groups in Accra on Friday, the NDC running mate urged the participants to look beyond party and ethnic affiliation and vote for her to provide the much needed interventions for women in the country. And many, many people have made it so. Many people have come before us, have worked in many different sectors to make this happen. But we also know that Ghana can do better and faster and that the time is now to make that happen. Women in our country are not uh, so visible at the top and we all know the reasons, many of them. Sometimes even to accept the position becomes a problem. So that is why sometimes you are not able to meet the quota because of the ways in which we perceive women in politics. All of these will have to be reviewed and all of these we have to transform if we are serious about seeing women in positions of um, power. I also saw in the, in the women in the field, as I see in this room, the dreams, the hopes, the good wishes, the aspirations. But all of these are important. And this is why I believe that uh, the ticket I'm running on offers us an opportunity to address some of these. I will never pretend to have all the answers at anything. If I did, this meeting would not have been necessary. We need to link minds. We, link, we need to link ideas. We need to link dreams. And we need to link efforts at results that matter. Well, uh, at that particular meeting last week with women professionals in Accra last Friday, the NDC running mate Nana Opokwajiman appealed to women in the country to look beyond party and ethnic affiliation and vote for her uh, to provide interventions for Ghanaian women. She challenged women who may not share her party's ideals to demonstrate their commitment to women empowerment by voting to ensure she becomes vice president. So is that a realistic call, given that the, pan the country is sharply divided along political lines? That's the question I pose to former Attorney General under the Atta Mills administration, Betty Muldedresu. I think it's a message in the right direction. And I think it's a particularly a message that a woman can get across very effectively. Um, it's not about politics here so much. Of course it is about politics because we are politicians. But it's also about the greater good of, of a woman being a unifying factor of 52% 50, of Ghanaians being women and forming the, the majority, or we should form the majority at least of those who go out to vote. So even if you are MPP or CPP or whatever, this time there's a woman there. So let's rally behind a woman and see if she cannot give you a better policy and a better uh, a gender framework within which we can all operate. And I think that her speech particularly articulated most of the concerns that women have. How do you respond to those who say gender will not necessarily be a factor uh, when it comes to the December 7? Because people already know where their support lies, they will vote along those lines come December 7. It's a pity that in Ghana we don't have very effective polling and, you know, um, how do you say, those, uh, the polls that, the exit polls and those that enable you to know which way things should be going. Because really, 
Um, gender is, is, is a problem. It's problematic being in the gender world. It's problematic in thinking that all women will vote for you just because you are a woman. A lot of us have experienced things very differently. But it's time for us to start rallying. And I have particularly been thrilled, you know, at quite a lot of the different women across the spectrum. Now, uh, religious leaders are cautioning against violence and the creation of fear and panic as the country heads to the polls on December 7. Speaking at the Maiden Joy Christian Election Forum on the theme, Election 2020, the role of the church, the leaders urge local churches to identify hotspots in their communities and campaign for peace. There's been the concern that the church does not engage actively in the country's political process. The church leaders are not holding them accountable. So I want to put this out there. A politician told you that. Yes, I want to put this out there, that all the local level congregational pastors, just make it a point that come 2021, the same politicians that came through your church, invite them on any church occasion and ask them to give you an account of what they have done so far regarding the promises they made. That is the only way we can hold them accountable. I say, mm. Bishop Wood, the Ghana police says that there are about 400 flashpoints in Ghana. I want to encourage you, form peace committees in your localities. As somebody is making up his mind to cause trouble, you make up your mind to cause peace. And I believe that we're going to have a successful election. We have always been doing it, and this is just going to be one of them to the glory of God. Uh, the church is to politics. I see. Church members, especially the clergy, may not get involved in party politics, but they have to be absolutely interested in what the politicians are doing, because what they do must please God in a way that we can get his blessings here on earth. So this is what I would say is the relationship between uh, the church and politics. Don't accuse one another. Don't insult one another on radio, on television. I'm talking to children of God, believers. Anything that your political party is doing which is not in the interest of the common good of the nation, reject it. Speak against it. Reject it. Don't be a sycophant and a hypocrite. Your allegiance and your loyalty first is for, to God, then your family then your nation, then your political party. And you heard the call, reject violence and commit to peace. That's how we end our program today. I'm Arbukumsi. Join us every weekday from 1.30 to 2.30 p.m. This has been Election Week.